Yeah, the global effect of Mr. Putin's war on Ukraine through a global connection uh, with Carl Baker, his senior advisor to Pacific Forum. Thank you for joining us today, Carl. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that it, when, you, when you just talk to somebody in, in some other part of Europe, it's like they're a million miles away. They, they don't feel the, the hot breath of Putin's war. And yet, um, there is hot breath of Putin's war. He is uh, undermining um, stability in some countries. He is having an effect not only on Europe, but uh, everywhere. And uh, it just shows you what, what kind of a mess an autocrat can make without hardly trying. Uh, so can we explore with you today, Carl, um, you know, what effect is Putin's persistent uh, and war crimes war having on everything? Well, it, it is having effect on everything. And, you know, where do you where do you start with the impacts? I mean, first, I think maybe maybe you start with the with the violation of the sovereignty principle, because I think that's a significant one. And I think that's where we expected other countries to recognize the risk involved, you know, because because ultimately by by invading Iraq, uh, in, invading Ukraine, he has he has sort of violated that principle, saying we can make up our own versions of sovereignty, you know, and that raises issues for for Europe because suddenly we're not we're not so sure about our borders anymore. Now we're seeing now with Turkey trying to you know claim territorial sovereignty over areas that are occupied by the Kurds in, in Northern Syria. Uh, of course, you know, in, in Asia, the big question is, is this the same sort of rationale that China is gonna use uh, to, to use military force against Taiwan? Because there, of course, the territorial issue is slightly different, but it is still the, the whole idea of, of Chinese sovereignty demands that they maintain unity of the, of the Chinese uh, uh, nation. So yeah, so I think sovereignty is is one of the big big issues that's that's involved here, and it's really sort of challenged the whole the whole notion that that uh, sovereignty is is something that everybody can agree on. Suddenly, China, who has long claimed that sort of uh, uh, or recognition of that of that issue of that principle, uh, aren't so convinced of it anymore. And I think that that's that's an important important shift. That's that's driving the dynamics, as you say, amongst other countries as well. well what about um, you know, the liberal world order? You know, the one emerged out of the Marshall Plan after World War II, uh, the liberal world order, which was, uh, you know, an expression of tolerance, uh, if you will, kindness, uh, uh, inclusivity, um, internationalism. Um, well, there's, I think there's a lot of things that are influencing that liberal international order, but certainly what what the, the war in Ukraine is doing specifically to that liberal order is it's challenging, I think, the Western supremacy in that order. Because, because I, I see what, what's happening with the war is that while you know, the United States and Europe initially were, were very confident that they had uh, convinced the rest of the world to condemn Russia, 140 countries, 141 countries, uh, you know, can agree to the condemnation in the UN resolution. But the fact is, is that it, it hasn't been universal. And countries like China, India, have, have sort of skirted around that whole Western dominance and said, well, this may be an opportunity for us to take advantage of Russia's position of, of being denied access to the Western markets. And, and we, can, we can get cheap gas and oil. So you've seen dramatic increases in the amount of uh, gas and oil that, that India has imported. Even, even more so than, than in China. And of course, in the rest of the world, you know, we, we've seen the same thing. The Middle East, Africa, South, South America have, have seen this as a, somewhat of an opportunity to, to shift away from, from Western, Western influence and, and take an advantage of, of the weak, weakness that is, is created by Europe facing, putting all its emphasis on Ukraine right now. And and global trade and the global economy, you know, we, we've we been thinking the world is flat for a long time and international trade, you know, has benefits to all the participants. Um, but but this war is, is having an effect on food and the supply line. It's having an effect on the uh, availability of uh, oil and, and gas. 
Um, what about that? What about the world economy? And uh, um, I know we're not doing so well for a bunch of reasons, but as we continue yeah. this war, as he continues this war, what's likely to happen to the global economy? Well, uh, that, that's, I, I think, an important issue because uh, you know, when we when this whole thing started, we said one of the things that's going to be the challenge for the West is going to be inflation, and we certainly do see inflation now. You know, in in the U.S., you know, we're we're, we're complaining about the the last CPI that came in over nine. You know, but the fact is, is that Europe is even worse. Europe is suffering even more because of the high price of, of gas and trying to find alternative sources for that gas and oil is, is turning out to be much more difficult than they thought. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that the world economy and, and specifically the Western economies are, are suffering from inflation. And, I, and that's part of, part of Putin's game plan is that he thinks that he can outlast the West because, because the West is going to grow tired of inflation. And I mean, I think, you know, if you look at, at what's happening in the United States, you can see that, that the Biden administration has shifted its focus entirely almost to, to taming inflation. The Republicans have picked it up as a political uh, cause to, to you know, uh, defeat, uh, defeat the, the Democrats in 22 and, and Biden in 24 as, as an issue that, that's near and dear to the American's heart because, because inflation is, is, is running rampant. And it's running rampant in, in uh, places in the United States that uh, are, are very interested in hearing that sort of rhetoric. You know, uh, it's, it's sad to say that this, it's a competition between self-interest and, and the global world order, um, the, the, um, the, the, the effort to stop autocracy, or at least control, contain autocracy. And, and, and then you throw in fatigue. And I think Putin understands all of those things. And, and the question I, I put to you, Carl, as you mentioned, you know, what, uh, fatigue. We get tired. The news cycle moves on. Something mm -hmm. else has to fill the headline space in the newspaper. Uh, yeah. The media needs to have some fresh news every day or two. Uh, you can only spend so much time on students in school. Um, and, um, you know, the various machinations of the Supreme Court and so forth. Um, and, and, and people want a change of subject. So they're tired of hearing about Ukraine. And they're tired of dealing with it. And um, that has an effect. And I think, don't you agree that Putin understands this? He's a smart man, at least in some ways. Um, and he's, he's, um, he's, he's, he's trying to time us out. He's trying to you know, wait until we lose interest, and we are. I that, exactly. I mean, that that is that has been, I think, his strategy from the beginning, is that he he feels that that he can outweigh uh, the United States and, and Europe, and especially Europe, because Europe is the one that's that's suffering most. You know, and so now with the you know with with the war sort of sort of solidifying, and it looks like there's there's really no end in sight. You know, there's, there's, I mean, there's no, there's no real negotiations going on. Uh, Russia has pretty much consolidated uh, its its position in in the east. It has it has taken Luhansk. It, it's on the way to taking Donetsk. You know, and so and so that was, you know, that that is certainly a a, a turning point because now what happens if 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 the West is going to continue supporting Ukraine to retake those territories, we're in for a long slog. You know, and and you know, you, you, you mentioned it before we started the show, but, you know, you've got, you've got Kaliningrad that is over on the other side of Lithuania. There was a lot of rhetoric about, you know, involving Lithuania in, in some sort of punitive action from Russia for, for blocking uh, access uh, between Russia and Kaliningrad. You know, well, that's been solved, but it hasn't been solved forever. You know, it's still an issue out there. And, and, expansion of the war is still an issue you know is is how long is nato going to be able to maintain this position of supporting ukraine without you know without engaging russian forces and how long is russia going to be willing to to uh stick to the stick to the script in just ukraine and and not be tempted to to move into other areas certainly you know in in terms of, of uh, information warfare and and trying to destabilize some of the other countries in in the balkans and the, 
and the, uh, the the Baltics. He's already done that. You know, clearly that the whole thing with with Lithuania was driven towards that. You know, and he's also trying to trying to foment uh, conflict between the Bosnians and the Serbs. So you know, so so clearly, you know, he sees the horizon as as very long in in trying to resolve this thing because he he I think believes that 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 the Russians can can withstand any any pressure from Europe because Europe is going to bend first because they're they're democracies they they have a, a more more individual voices that are going to be raised to to resist this where he's he's pretty much in control of of all information in Russia so you know if you're if you're in Moscow and St Petersburg yeah, there's a war, but it's a special it, uh, it's a special operation. It's not really a war, and 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 Ukraine does really belong to Russia. So you know everything is is fine, and and you know that's just the, the fact of uh, of a democracy versus a uh, an autocracy. And then the cold weather is coming, and the blackmail that he wants to use on those countries where it gets cold, like Germany. Will be yeah. uh, more more effective uh, as the temperature drops. No. Yeah. Well, you know that was uh, that's Tom Friedman's uh, argument in, in a piece of New York Times. If you if you saw it, you know he he's saying that that it's it's Putin's winter strategy versus NATO's summer strategy. You know, and 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 we're right now we're we're sort of at the nexus of that of that uh, strat of those strategies. You know, and and how does that how does that play out? And it, it's it. it I don't know how it plays out, but it's not going to play out in weeks. It's going to play out in months, and and that means that we're going to get into the winter, and and Germany and Italy and France and the rest of Europe are going to have to figure out where they're going to get the gas from, because because right now, uh, if you're going to if you're honestly going to move away from Russian gas, you're going to have to find a a, a big source somewhere, and that isn't in Bahrain or Qatar or uh, small natural gas producers like that. Can't the U.S. help? There was discussion early on, early on in the war, that the U.S. would deliver a natural gas um, to, say, Germany. Um, yeah, but is but, that but happening? It's a, but it's an infrastructure problem. I mean, LNG, you know, natural gas has to be liquefied and put onto LNG containers, and then you've got to have a port that you can actually put that ship into and uh, and 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 offload it. That's not, you know, that's not a pipeline. And and you know, with with the pipelines there. You know everything is geared toward toward a Euro Asia a Euro Asian uh, flow of of uh, natural resources there. So yeah, yeah, it's going to be very difficult. You know, I mean, I just and it, just like the agricultural products. You know, I mean, again, you know, the, the United States and Europe saw saw some inflation in in the grain prices. You know, but in in Africa, people are dying. You know, because of this, because they simply can't get they can't get the grain, and the grain that that is out there is is really expensive. We we had a show yesterday with uh, somebody in uh, uh, Kampala, and um, mm -hmm. what a very interesting remark was that um, not only do people die because they're hungry, but because the lack of food destabilizes government, destabilizes a, a given country of sovereignty. Yeah. So, so you you know you get a greater likelihood of, of violence in a country that's hungry, and this is going to be happening more, no? Yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 that that destabilization doesn't doesn't bode well for Western influence again, because you've got you've got China, you've got Russia, who are are, and, and India for that matter, and and to some extent the Middle Eastern countries are taking advantage of of this of this blockade. You know, and they're they're taking the cheap resources and they're and they're influencing these other places in the world. So you know, so so then it comes to you know another issue that that comes out of this is the effectiveness of sanctions. You know, the United the the United States and Europe's almost entire strategy is is a sanctions based strategy, and and clearly the rest of the world didn't get the memo that everybody has to implement sanctions because sanctions are complicated. You know, it it takes it takes a lot of a lot of effort to implement sanctions effectively. And and what interest do I have if I'm in, let's say, Indonesia, to implement sanctions on behalf of uh, Europe and the United States? I, I've got to put manpower against this. And and what do I get out of it? Not a lot. You know, so so I'm going to look at it and say, yeah, uh, we we agree, we support we support. Uh, 
your your uh, condemnation, but uh, we'll we'll get around to those sanctions after we uh, improve our trade relations a little bit uh, with other countries, and uh, you know all will be better off. And I think that that's sort of the mindset that's setting in. And then it goes back to that whole you know U.S. versus China narrative of of what what is your what is your long term prospect? What are what are your what are your what is your promise? You know, the Chinese promise, of course, is this is this wonderful world of of, of mutual respect and, and mutual benefit from from, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure development and uh, goodwill. You know, and the United States long term prospect is, well, we're going to have a war here and then we're going to have another one, uh, you know, over over Taiwan. And, you know, and, and, it, and, it, and, and to the rest of the world, it looks like, hmm. Maybe maybe China's on to something here. Maybe we should be a little more neutral about this because it seems that they're benefiting from it. You know, and so I think I think ultimately, you know, that's that's sort of again, it it, it comes to the erosion of, of of the liberal international order and Western influence in uh, making rules and developing standards for that order. Yeah. Um, can, can we talk for a minute about uh, you know this is. Mm. This is a hybrid war. It was clear only in a few days after Putin started this war that it was a war, you know, to to rain terror down on people, um, to kill civilians uh, even more quickly than military, to destroy uh, residential areas and all infrastructure, um, and um, and then at the same time um, to use his uh, his tools, internet tools, to hack into. Um, the internet of Ukraine and other countries around, uh, as he has done before with, with you know other initiatives in other parts of Europe, um, and also you know espionage and and trying to corrupt and convert people, such as what he did with uh, Zelensky's um, Zelensky's staff, uh, where Zelensky found only a couple of days ago that Putin had, had turned his staff, had corrupted them, and now they were working for Russia for reasons that we will probably find out. Uh, and to say, you know, for example, I'm thinking of Moldova, that Putin has people all over Moldova turning it um, and threatening. And, you know, a, a, a thousand different techniques all in play in Eastern Europe and every country there, uh, you know, and using uh, Erdogan to slow down uh, the applications of what is it, Sweden and Finland to get into the uh, into NATO. Um, I mean, all these diplomatic um, and under the surface efforts at trying to disrupt um, the, the coalition, disrupt the coalition and advance his interest in every country around, um, around Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's impressive. Uh, is it gonna work? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that, I think that's the simple answer is, you know, I, I mean, let's let's look at it from from Putin's perspective. That's what the West is doing. Also, they're trying to influence the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, so so, of course, he's going to do that. I mean, because he sees this as a civilizational struggle. You know, he sees this as as the resurrection of, of the Russian of the Russian civilization. And so and so he, he of course, he's going to use all means available. I think that's I, I don't I don't find that uh, surprising, you know. I mean, I think I think Erdogan, uh, you know, President Erdogan from Turkey. I think he had other motivations about Sweden and uh, and uh, Finland joining joining NATO. He, I mean, and he has his own issues with Russia, you know, uh, over over what's happening in uh, in uh, northern Syria, you know. So I think that that's uh, that's important to to appreciate, you know that that. Uh, that that he Putin sees this as as uh, a natural extension of his ability to to uh, defeat the West. Yeah, and and it's like you need a a world map hanging on your office wall with little pins um, to identify all the maneuvers he's doing everywhere, all day. Mm -hmm. It's not just the Donbass. It's maneuvers in so many countries and places. So many yep. incidents are happening. So many mm, mm, tricks and tips that he's using. 
Uh, you kind of give them credit for doing that. And you know what? What's interesting is uh, your, your point a minute ago is that the coalition believed, and probably you know, in a larger sense still believes, uh, that the sanctions uh, will work. Uh, but it's not clear, that, and, and, that, and they will deprive Putin of resources. But what he's doing on that map doesn't take a lot of resources. All it takes is a few phone calls and meetings and, and smart maneuvering. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not like he has to spend a lot of money doing those things. So it's, it's just another example, I think, of the fact that the sanctions aren't working. Um, some countries who you would expect help from are not providing help, you know, solidarity on the sanctions. Uh, and, and Putin is now into, what, week number six? I get that right. Um, and, and, and the sanctions haven't slowed him down. Well, you know, and, and there's an argument about whether sanctions, you know, in, in the West, there's still people who believe that these sanctions are, you know, and they talk about, you know, the reduction in, in GDP next year is going to be 10%, you know, some, some, some whatever numbers they are, but that's all they are, are numbers, you know, because I think, I think Putin, Putin has resources and those resources are, are for sale. And, and, you know, and it's, again, and the sanctions, it's not so much that people aren't supporting the sanctions as they aren't, they aren't not support, uh, how do I say this? They're, you know, sanctions require effort. Implementation of sanctions require effort. And what they're not doing is they're not putting forth effort to implement sanctions. And so the sanctions are there, but only if you take the time and, and spend the resources to implement those sanctions. You know, I saw an article that, that Britain is having to double it, the size of the organization that implements sanctions because all these sanctions have been put into place, but there's nobody to really implement them. There's nobody to actually check all the license that, licenses that have to be issued, all the reports that have to be done to do that. It's, it's a huge administrative task. You know, and, so, and so it's like, you know, economic sanctions are fine, but you have to understand that, that economic warfare requires manpower, just like military requires manpower. And that's, and that's hard to come up with, with that manpower because there's no, again, like I was giving the example of Indonesia, there's no, no particular benefit for, for countries that aren't directly involved with this conflict. Yeah, and, and, and political focus too. There was a piece on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago about how the oligarchs had uh, acquired, had purchased huge amounts of um, the high-end residential properties in London. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, and they are spending money there. They are coming and going and spending money. Some of it is for lobbying, lobbying the members of parliament. And other members of parliament, um, you know, taking the position, wait a minute, they're trying to influence the UK on dealing with, you know, the coalition and sanctions mm -hmm. and all that, politically influence them. Uh, and of course, the, by definition, the oligarchs are extension of Putin. Um, and so th that's a whole new ball game, isn't it? You buy up valuable properties, you invest uh, in, you know, in businesses, what have you. You, you bring money into a given country, and uh, then, you, then you schmooze with um, the people who run the country and try to change their political will. It's very clear what Putin is doing there, and, I, and God knows what other countries would be even easier for him to, to reach in the yeah. same way. Uh, well, I mean, look, look, at, look at the Middle East. I mean, if you look at a, at a colored map of, of who's actively supporting uh, the West and who's sort of passively just watching the Middle East is the, is the color of passively watching. <laughs> you know, they're, they are not, they are not really actively engaged. And if you, you know, if you watch some of the, some of the comments by the Saudis during the Biden visit, you know, they said, look, we, 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 we respond to the market. If the market demands more oil, we'll put more oil out, but you have to give it time. You know, we're not, we're not going to just, just jump up and say, here, here's oil because uh, Joe Biden says we need to pump more oil. You know they're they're very calculating in it, and you know and and India, China, you know they've both said you know hey we don't mind we don't mind cheap oil. We have we have economies that need to be developed. You know and and uh, and this is we don't have inflation. You, you guys in the West have inflation because because of your own actions. You know so you look at I mean look at China. They they have they have economic problems, but one of them is not inflation. 
you know, so so clearly the West is 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 suffering the impact, which is uh, what Putin understood from the beginning, is that the, the countries that are going to going to have the, the biggest impact are the ones that are going to be the most uh, adamant about implementing uh, sanctions on Russian goods. Yeah, so um, yeah, let, let's talk about um, the U.S. The effects of Putin's war on the U.S. is it's really interesting because the mm -hmm. U.S. seems to me to be very vulnerable on um, you know a foreign policy level right now, um, very vulnerable certainly on the Ukraine level right now because of its um, you know internal arguments over every issue. Why not this one too? And um, and I'm wondering how long the U.S. can last, and talk about fatigue, how long can the U.S. last this way uh, when, when each side, especially the Republicans, want to find a way to attack Joe Biden? Um, where's that $40 billion that was supposed to go directly from Congress into long-range long -range artillery in the Ukraine? We haven't heard anything about that. Uh, are we following through? Are we having fatigue? Are we having an argument under the hood? Uh, is Joe Manchin really going to support further, you know, efforts to protect Ukraine, or are we going to, you know, turn into a a, a politicized um, argument on that one too? Well, I think so far, you know, it's been fairly, uh, fairly, fairly bipartisan support for for giving Ukraine aid. I'm not aware of anything that. That we haven't delivered, that we said we were going to deliver. I think I think both sides have been have been pretty supportive. But you know where where your point is is valid. I think is all the other distractions that get in the way. You know that that at some point, when you start trying to fight inflation, then you're going to you're going to lose sight of of what your real objective is here, because it's going to become more and more difficult to maintain support for Ukraine. And and you know, in all honesty, what 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 I see coming soon is a lot of pressure from the West, U.S. and Europe, for Ukraine to start thinking about what is the settlement. And and I say settlement because you know, as far as Ukraine is concerned, they have, they have stated their objective is to take back Donetsk and Luhansk, and 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 Crimea, by the way. While we're at it, you know that. That, that is a very ambitious goal, given the fact that it never had control of the entire province of, of Luhansk and Vitesk, and it, and it hasn't had control of Crimea since, since 2014, and there are legal structures now in place that would require something more than just a, 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 a freedom march down the streets. You know, so, so at some point, the, the real challenge for the, for the West and the United States is going to come when we start trying to figure out how do we resolve how do we resolve the the, the the conflict? You know, do we really stick by Ukraine for the long haul of trying to take back these territories? And how much of those territories do we take back? That's where I think you might start seeing some some political opportunism in the United States. And and then yeah, and then and then you go back to the to the weakness of of the American uh, political system right now, especially in the legislative branch, where people will take those cheap pot shots because they see it as, as self-promotion, basically. Oh, one of the things that Putin seems to be doing in um, um, a kind of, um, well, he's got the war going on, the kinetic war, shooting up everything. And then he's got all the hybrid things. Um, and he's kind of encircling encircling Zelensky, making it harder and harder for Zelensky to actually run a government, um, and having the country fall apart physically around him, having his staff fall apart, having his neighbors fall apart, and just waiting, waiting for France to get tired, uh, waiting for Germany to get cold, waiting for Italy to you know, go into chaos, wait, waiting for the UK to rethink its whole policy be because of Boris Johnson's uh, you know, re resignation and waiting for the U.S. to implode. Um, mm. So waiting is a good, good, and you said this was conceptual encirclement around Ukraine. The other element there, Carl, and this is my last question to you, I think. The other element is um, we have really seen no legitimate 
sincere effort on the part of, of Putin to talk settlement. And his position now is stronger than it was when that was, when that was visible. So query, you know, if, even if we all agreed that settlement discussions should happen, is he really willing to do that? Or is he going to tough it out right to the Western border? That, I mean, that isn't what he promised. You know, what he, what he, what he promised was he's going to get a corridor from, from Crimea, take Donetsk and Luhansk, and stop there. You know, I think, I think you know, his, initial, his initial plan may have been uh, bolder, but I think, you know, I think that, that right now he would have you believe that he will settle for that area. For the, for the basically the eastern part of Ukraine, and that would be that would be a settlement that I think he would accept. Now the real question becomes for how long. You know, I think I think that in, in other words, you know, yeah, he'll take that he'll take that settlement today, and and you know get the Amer get the West distracted a little bit, and then maybe rethink what he did and go back and try again. You know, so I think that that. I, I, he certainly has a winning hand at this point because that would be a settlement that would be dramatically in his favor, and it would look like he was settling for something. And and you know, and then and then it's a question of time. Is is that just a matter of time before he he moves to to retake the rest of Ukraine, or at least turn Ukraine into such a failed state that it it implodes in, onto itself? Mm. You know, so I think that 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 that's that's sort of where I see. Putin's calculus right now is is if if they want to start talking about settlement, I'll talk settlement with control of of the of the two provinces plus Crimea and and the corridor that links the two. And I've I've got my buffer. I mean, if you you know if you believe his words that all he was really looking for was a security buffer, he can say I've got that, and he looks like a winner. I mean that that is a is a a win for him, and and. It, doesn't mean that that's where he stops, but it's where it's where he can stop now and make it look good and get the West distracted from from sanctions and all that other stuff. Well, looking looking at this from a foreign policy and a, a diplomacy point of view, how could let's assume that that is the that the reality from a foreign policy point of view that that it is time for us to do that, to save lives and to mm -hmm. you know address other more important things like climate change and COVID and world trade and the global economy. And those things are really important. And we were distracted by them. We, mm -hmm. you know, we're too busy with this war somehow. And so, so let's assume the United States made a, um, a, a policy decision that it was going to uh, try to uh, enhance uh, settlement discussions or initiate settlement discussions. Um, and, and that is a that is a kind of interesting possibility. I mean, look look at the many times the United States has um, had the same thought about Israel and, and the Palestinians, and look where that's gone over decades and decades. But let's assume the United States wants to do that. I ask you this as uh, someone who has been involved in diplomacy for a long time and seen you know diplomatic uh, the ebb and flow of diplomacy around the world for so many years. So the question is, how do you initiate those discussions legitimately? Um, what, what steps do you take? And, and uh, yes, uh, certainly we agree that, that Putin may be using this as a way, as a stepping stone, a, a lily pad kind of stepping stone. So the question is, how, how do you make an agreement? What terms do you put in that settlement agreement uh, to limit his options there? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, I think uh, assuming that you could get Zelensky on board with with some sort of compromise, because that's not clear to me that you can at this point, you know, other than other than threatening him to to withdraw uh, military support if he doesn't if he doesn't get on board. I think, you know, what you would have to do is you'd have to start thinking about some sort of some sort of demilitarized zone in in the on the border of, of those provinces and and the, uh, the the strip down to uh, uh, Crimea and and you know and, and probably put some sort of a some sort of a line by Kherson you know to to keep Odessa as a as a Ukrainian city 
uh, and and then you'd have to you'd have to build up military force in Ukraine, you know, and have some some sort of a guarantee that that Zelensky would have a military force capable of of deterring further incursions into the rest of Ukraine. You'd have to have uh, the European Union would have to put a pretty big economic commitment to to support a, a uh, shrunk Ukraine. It, you know, so that so that you would have to have you'd have to have U Ukraine become part of the European Union. You'd have to have them uh, provide a lot of economic support, just a, a Marshall Plan sort of uh, reconstruction effort in the rest of Ukraine, and and then you'd have to have some some promise for what it's worth from Russia that that they will withdraw some of those forces from from uh, the eastern those eastern provinces. So. Oh. Is there a way to cast this to make it um, not sound like Chamberlain and Munich and appeasement? Well, I think we're past. I think we're we're past that. Given that that the, the war has happened, you know, and so I, I, I think more in more in terms of, of 1945 rather than 1939. You know that that you, you you have to accept that that Russia has been partially successful. In those areas, because they were they, they they controlled a lot of those areas from the beginning. So you know, so so you have. I think you have to accept it, it, diplomatically. I mean, I'm saying if you, if you're looking for a settlement, you have to accept that Russia has been successful in those areas and and concede that that territory. But that's not an easy thing for for Putin to or for uh, for Zelensky to do. Obviously, you know, to actually concede that territory. So I I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's so much appeasement anymore as as accepting the reality and and accepting the reality uh, going back to what you said to get on to a, to bigger things. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> um, not to, not to criticize Biden about this, but I wonder, could we, you know, right now, as you said, uh, Putin has a, a, a good hand. He has a good hand, um, and he'll play that out as a very smart poker player for sure. Whatever happens, but. Um, if you went back to the beginning of this, Carl, knowing what we know now, how, if at all, could we have handled it better so as not to allow Putin to get this far? I, I mean, I, 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 that's really armchair quarterback kind of stuff, uh, or armed, armchair general, I guess, more ap apropos, uh, you know, trying to trying to think about how you how, rethink how you could have done it. I mean, you. I don't know. I mean, you know, given given what what Putin started with, you know, and just the fact that they were able to blunt the the, the progress toward toward Kiev is is an achievement in itself. You know, given that it took as long as it did to gain what he did, you know, is probably the best you could hope for without some sort of external intervention on the part of of uh, NATO. Uh, you know, which would have been a very, a very risky strategy, I think, uh, for for NATO to pursue. But if that's probably where it would have had to come. It would have had to come from from some sort of a some sort of a a, a flanking movement uh, to to get behind the Russians in the east there somehow. You know, and, and so it would have been it it would have been almost. I think you would have had to have some sort of NATO involvement to be able to pull it off. Uh, you know, and that's, I mean, there's obviously big risks that people simply weren't willing to take there. Is NATO part of the solution here? I mean, you mentioned that the troops might come from the EU, uh, a, a buffer zone. Well, I didn't even say, I didn't even mention, I didn't even mention troops. I just sort of left out the whole military component of it. Uh, because I think, no, I, I think, I don't, I don't think you can turn around now and say, uh, we're going to we're, we're going to let NATO or let Ukraine join NATO. I just don't think I just don't think that was an, uh, I don't think that's an option. I, I don't think that would be acceptable because that would give Putin every excuse to to go back and and try again. So what's the lesson of all this? You know, I mean, my my concern is when when we put down our pens and close the classroom door, um, what have we learned about limiting autocrats? What have we learned well, about about trying to make a or pre preserve a, a peaceful liberal liberal world? It's it's difficult because you have because you still have this 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 focus on the state. 
you know, and as long as as long as the state is the primary actor, there's always going to be people who use the state for those purposes. And and so I think, you know, to me, the big lesson is we really need to learn how to how to how to move away from state influence and 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 make multilateral regimes more resilient. But that's very much a uh, a, a a liberal sort of perspective on on how to how to fix problems centered around state uh, belligerence. And the United Nations, um, what about them? It seems to me that when you're talking about uh, the international order, we should be talking about the United Nations, and yet uh, they have not presented as a, a relevant force in all this. Um, no, it, it has to be it has to be a, a reformed United Nations, which of course introduces a whole realm of, of why it's so difficult to to do that because states basically control the United Nations. The United Nations are still are still beholden to state power. Yeah, and one of the implications of what's happened over the past few months is that we have seen. We, if we didn't know it before, the, the United Nations is is powerless in a um, you know an argument in which uh, members of the Security Council are involved. Yeah. It's clear. It's clear now. It wasn't so clear before, and that revelation is part of the implications of what's going on. Yeah. Well, I, I think it has been clear. I mean, it was clear in the Cold War. We've just forgotten how clear it was. But it's always been it's it's always been a fact that that the United Nations. Is is powerless in in the context of great power competition. And the last thought is, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you one more implication: is just as the United Nations has you know been shown uh, for its lack of power, um, it seems to me that we are actually because of Putin's remarks and his stockpile of bombs um, that we are closer to nuclear war now than we were uh, at the beginning of this. Am I right? Yeah, I think you're right. And also, the other the other thing that we didn't talk about is is there's a, there's now a, a an inclination on the part of other countries to privilege nuclear weapons because the the narrative has been is that the reason NATO didn't engage was because they were concerned about a nuclear uh, response from from Russia. So now what you're seeing and and Ukraine was was subject to this because it didn't keep its nuclear weapons. And those that, there's there's a whole discussion there, but I they're going to cut us off here in a minute. Uh, so I, I don't have time to get into that, but you have Japan, you have Korea rethinking, you know, how how good is this nuclear umbrella? Should we really have the capacity to to get our own nuclear weapons? And and this this is sort of the mindset. North Korea is congratulating itself for developing its nuclear weapons. Iran is thinking maybe we need to get ours next. So yeah, so it's opened a whole new new range of thinking about the value of nuclear weapons also. Okay, well, that makes me feel a lot better, Carl. Uh, okay. <laughs> as, as I have told other people in other similar shows, I, it's time for me to leave this discussion and go soak my head. Uh, but <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you for your insights and enlightenment on this. Carl Baker, uh, Senior Advisor at Pacific Forum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.